Riesling, Rosé, Bordeaux, Burgundy, Tartelette au Chester, Petite Fondue, Frite, Roquefort, Camembert, Brie, and Cheddar. We're having a cheese and wine party today on The French Chef. The French Chef is made possible by a grant from the Polaroid Corporation. Welcome to the French Chef. I'm Julia Child. You know, when you want to have an informal get-together party, it's awfully nice to have it after dinner because you can make it very easy to do. You can have a minor wine and cheese tasting, for instance, and if you have that, you don't have to cook anything at all. You can just have the wine and cheese. But if you want to, and I usually like to because I think it's fun, you can have a little something because it makes it a little bit more of a party. And I'm going to propose some little cheese tidbits that are very easy to do and which I think that you will enjoy. These are called little fondue frites. And these are little tartelettes au ch Oh, Chester, which means it's tart, little tartlets with cheddar cheese. And I'm purposely, I'm purposely doing s some, both of these things because they're both very French. And in French, these little tiny things are called little bouchers, meaning little mouthfuls. And also, I'm purposely doing pastry because that also is very French. And I want, I want, as usual, to urge you to do pastry. Now, these are the kind of little tartlet molds that are used a great deal for this kind of thing, and they're made out of what's called tôle et tamé, which is a little tinned metal. And you can buy them in France if you go over there, and you can often buy them in the uh, French import shops. And if you can't find them at all, you can use a muffin tin, either one. I'm going to show you how to do them both ways. And we have our dough here, which is good and hard. And you sprinkle our marble with our board with a little bit of flour, and then beat it. And I'm not beating it up to be funny, but this is just to soften it and then get it rolling. And what's wonderful about having your own dough is because it's made out of good butter and it has a wonderful flavor. And you can make a whole lot of it and keep it in the freezer. And then any time you're going to have a little party, you can make a, a tiny tidbit. You can, for these, you can, of course, if you prefer, use a ready mix. And this is to be rolled out about an eighth of an inch thick. And there it is. This is a very, just a very nice pie dough. And I like, using, I like using a marble, and you can get these in furniture and parts stores because it's always it's cool and it's very easy to roll things out on. And now we have the dough rolled out. You want to cut it. And this is a just a round cutter, and it's fluted, and it's about three inches, and the molds are about two inches and three quarters, so it has to be just a little bit bigger than the mold. And then, just cut right through the dough. I'm doing, as usual, I'm doing a sampling, just so that you can get the idea of things. I'm just doing six, and then the pastry just gets lifted off. And that one I didn't cut through quite well, but it doesn't make any difference in that. You just roll up in knead into a ball and roll out again. And if it gets hard to roll, which it often does, you'll just have to let it relax and chill in the refrigerator, maybe for an hour. So make plenty of pastry so you'll have enough. And also, if you're going to have get little molds, get plenty of little molds, about two or three dozen. Because you can form these little things way ahead of time, and it's an awful nuisance if you only have a dozen molds. And you have to keep refilling them. Now, see, I've put the pastry in, and now with your thumb, 
can just take the extra off. And the extra you can add to your pastry scraps. And then push it up again with your fingers just a little bit to make a nice little edge all around. See, actually it doesn't make any difference. You don't have to have a fluted mold because you're going to push the dough up anyway so that you lose the flute. And remember, pushing up that little edge all around. And the reason that you do this is to make the dough even thinner, because for a little tartlet, you don't want to have thick dough. And I didn't push that up. Now, here's how you do the muffin tins. You just put it right in and press it down with your fingers. And it really, it works surprisingly well because it, it makes the, out, the outside is perfectly nice and then you can even up the inside with your fingers. It makes a slightly deeper tartlet. At least it does using, using the uh, circle this size. But you have to use your, and your Yankee ingenuity if you don't have exactly the right material, but you can usually find something. And then you want to take a fork and prick it all through, and this will keep the pastry from rising. Prick, 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 prick. Seems to me everything, so many French things get little fork pricks like this in there with the little molds. Of course, doing something like this, the, the tartlet is a little bit of trouble, but I think with something like this, it shows that you care. And the, something that's done in pastry is always very dressy. And even as though it's terribly simple, like these little bouchers that we're going to make, you'll find that they're very attractive. And, and people think, how, how nice, <laughs> which is, I think, a good, a good thing for people to think when they come to your house. Now these, this is just diced cheddar cheese. You can use diced Swiss cheese, or you could use Roquefort cheese. And you fill up the little molds. And I'm going to make the, make the mixture. Here is 2 thirds cup of heavy cream. This is actually creme fraiche. And in it, you have one whole egg. It's, sort of, it's a really a kind of a quiche mixture. And then you have some, a little bit of this hot pepper sauce, about four, five, six shakes, and a little bit of Worcestershire. There was one, two, boom. That maybe was a little bit too much, but I don't think so, because you want to have quite a bit of flavor. Several nice grinds of pepper and a bit of salt. Not too much, because the cheese has salt in it. And then, this get, goes right, about a good spoonful goes right into each little cartlet. Don't want too much, but you want enough to cover up the cheese. And I always put quite a bit of cheese in, because the, it, they, they sink down a little bit after baking. You do exactly the same thing for your muffin tins. And then you set them all on a baking sheet. And they go into an oven. There would be far more than th three. This would hold about, oh, at least a dozen. And they go into a preheated 425 degree oven. And they bake for about 10 to 15 minutes. About 15 minutes, I say, and you, I think you'd find in the muffin tins it would be about 20 until they've puffed and browned nicely. And you just have to keep your eye on them after the last 12 to 15 minutes. And then, to get them out, you just take a, a knife and 
there they are. And you can use the molds over again. But those are very nice little things, aren't they? Now the next, that, that, that's that for these, for these little tidbits. And the next thing we're going to do is these little fondue feet, which are little cheese balls that are fried in deep fat. And these too are very easy to do. And what you want is half a cup, half a cup of flour. And I find that this instantized flour is the one that's, that works very well for this because you have to, it's going to be a thick sauce and you have to gradually beat some milk in it, about a cup and a quarter to a cup and a half of milk. And it has to be quite absolutely free from lumps before it goes onto the heat. And it goes onto heat as you're adding in the rest. I'm not going to add quite all of a cup and a half because it's going to be a little, might be a little too much and I want the sauce to be very, very thick. And then you stir it with a, with a wire whip. And as it begins to come up to the boil, it'll begin to lump just a little bit. Which it is slowly coming. And while that's coming to the heat, I'm going to we're going to have to have some egg yolks in it. Oh, no, there she comes. I can't wait. <laughs> thing is, you have to keep your eye right on it so I can feel in there that those little lumps forming. It's at this point that you want to really thoroughly stir. There she comes. You can see those lumps. Now what's a good idea at this point is then to take it off heat and beat vigorously. And then back onto the heat again. What you want to do is a very thick sauce. And then I've got to turn it down a little bit and let it just boil a bit. Now you can see how thick that is. It sticks in that whip. That's just the way you want it to be. There, you know, there are several ways of making thick sauces like this. One is for the, now we're gonna have some two tablespoons of butter and I've got some nice soft butter that'll go nicely in there. That gets beaten in. Now it's gonna have two egg yolks. That goes right into this hot sauce. You can see that really is good and thick. This is very much like a like a pâte à choux. You remember the cream puff pastry that we've made several times. And then it's going to have one cup of cheese that's going to go in. And this is just grated combination of grated Swiss and Parmesan, or you can use leftover cheese if you happen to have. It's a good way to use up, you know, those cheese tidbits that one keeps getting that collect in the ice box. And I'm going to put in a little sage, about oh, a good half teaspoon, and a little bit of nutmeg, which is usually nice with with cheese and some pepper from the pepper grinder and possibly a little bit of salt. I think I'd better taste it first to see how it is. That very definitely needs some salt. Don't, don't forget to taste.
you know, you can see that's a good thick sauce and that's just the way it's supposed to be. And it's going to get even thicker because it's going to have to chill. Now that's a, is a very easy sauce indeed. And it's the, these little fondues you can use, not only cheese egg, you could use half a cup of cheese and then you could use uh, half a cup of very finely diced ham or chicken livers or even chicken. What it actually is, is, um, is, a, is a croquette. known by another name. And I want to show you the difference in consistency, which isn't tremendous, but even so that is a little, still a little soft. And this is, this has quite a bit more consistency and it's going to be easier to form. So chill this, clean the sides off the pan. I mean the clean off the sides of the pan with your rubber spatula like that. And then either uh, put a little bit of melted butter on the top or else a piece of plastic wrap. And then chill it, and then you're ready to form it. And these are going to be coated in breadcrumbs just like that. And here's how you go about it. You take about a one tablespoon bit that's a little bit more than a one tablespoon bit there, and you put it into f just rolling flour, and then form it into a ball, or any shape that you like. I'll form this one into a ball, and then in it goes into beaten egg. And this is where those two egg whites went. There's, this is two egg whites, one egg, one tablespoon of oil, and one teaspoon of water. And then with two forks, you lift it up, drain off the excess egg, and then it goes into a plate of fresh white breadcrumbs. Then make sure that it's nicely coated all over. I'll do, I'll do one more so you'll remember how to do it. And be sure that you get your plates arranged like this. There's your tablespoon bit, and then with a little bit of flour, and then I'll roll it into a long shape like that. Then into the egg. This is, this is fun to do if you have several people and then one person can do each one of these movements. And then into your breadcrumbs. Then onto your plate. And it's a good idea to do, uh, to do them ahead because that allows the uh, breadcrumbs to set the way they should. And then it's going to be fried in deep fat and you want to be sure that be, be sure that the egg white, that the breadcrumbs stick on so that you could do the forming way ahead and then cover it with plastic wrap or something and put it in the refrigerator and fry them the next day. And I think the rest of the cooking should be done fairly close to the last moment and you'll see how that goes. Now we have regular cooking oil and this of uh, an electric fire that is set for about 400 degrees. And I always find that even though they say it's good to fry things at 375, 400 really seems to be better because as soon as you put the things to be fried in the fat, the temperature immediately sinks down. And I think only fry four to five at once, which means that you do have to do some frying ahead. And these have you have about three inches of oil here. Let's see how they're doing. They don't, it just only takes about a minute or two until they're nice and brown. And then out they come. I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut one so you can see how it, how it looks. And you'll see why it's called a fondue. See that's that's lovely soft and the cheese is all melted and it's sim simply delicious. But 
Of course, you have to fry these ahead because otherwise, well, otherwise they'd be cold and they have to be warm. And then to reheat them, you put them on a pastry plaque and put them in a preheated 450 degree oven, but only for about three or four minutes. If you leave them in the warming oven, they, they get so soft that they might burst. So, three, three or four minutes at 450 is the way to do it. I'm just going to see how everything looks in the dining room. Now, these little bouchers and these tartlets go extremely well with wine, I think. And we have here for our wine tasting, I think we have six types of wine. And what I have done, because I think that's fun, is to get French wines and then their American counterparts. So we have here, you start out with the, with the lightest and the driest wine. And so this is a Riesling, and we have a Riesling from Alsace and a Riesling from California, oh, Johannesburg Riesling. And it's fun to taste them out and see how you think our own products are doing. And with the Rieslings, you would chill them for an hour or two, and you open them just at the last minute, just before serving. And here is a rosé. This happens to be a French rosé, a Tavel. But there's also a very good California rosé called a Grenache, G-R-E-N-A-C-H-E. Rosé, and that it's interesting to try out those two. And there are other French rosés too. There are some from the Anjou, which are lighter. And the rosés are also served chilled. And these also you open at the very last moment. And the rosés, uh, people always like to know a good rosé because it's such a useful wine. And then the next, next in strength, I would think, would be the hearty young Beaujolais, the kind of wine that you serve with stews and meats and inform, informal foods. And these should be, I would say, at a cool room temperature. You don't want to have them too warm. I think if you had them, say, down in the cellar, if it weren't too cold there, and then you open them just shortly before serving. We have a California Zinfandel that is, that is the equivalent of the Beaujolais, or I mean the same type of wine. And then you have your Bordeaux, you're getting into the more mature and serious wines. And these should be at a normal room temperature, if your normal room temperature isn't too hot, at around 62, 63. And they should be open about two or three hours before serving. This is the French Médoc, and this is the California one that's made of the same grape called a Cabernet Sauvignon. And then you have get into the serious white wines, the great white Burgundies. We have the Cal uh, they have the Pinot from Burgundy and the Pinot Chardonnay, or what is its name? Yes, I think Pinot Chardonnay from California, which are the two of the same grapes. It's interesting to compare them. These are chilled and open just before serving, but don't chill them too much because they'll lose their flavor. And then you have the great red burgundies. And these also should be served at not too warm a room temperature, again, in the 60s. And these you would open, well, opinions vary. I like to open them about an hour before serving, but then it depends on the wine. This is the French one, and this is the California the Pinot Noir, which is made from much the same grape. But this makes a really interesting choice of wines, I think. And to go over again about the chilling, it's the white wines and the rosés that get chilled for an hour or so. And the red wines, I think it's terribly important if you want to enjoy red wines, I think you must buy them and have them in the house two or three weeks at least before serving. Because if you buy a red wine, and particularly a great Bordeaux, and bring it home and try and drink it that night, you say, ooh, that's an awful wine, and I spent all that money for it. But it's probably because it didn't rest long enough in the house, and it hadn't reconstituted itself, because it, all the sediments got mixed up with it. Let's get some good books, because uh, there are quite a number of them on the market, and they'll tell you about wines, and you'll enjoy it much more. And very important also is the glass. And this is the tulip-shaped glass. And you fill it for a wine tasting. You fill it not very full, about, heavens, that isn't even a third. And then hold it by its base. 
And the reason you hold it by its base is it so that if you have any perfume or soap on your hands, you won't, you won't smell it. And then you want to swirl it and you smell it. Mm -hmm. you make lovely remarks, which you can find out how to make when you read good books. And then look at its robe and see how it is. And then if you're going to say that you had just a little bit of wine left in your glass like that, and you're going to taste another wine, you pour it out into a bucket. I'm not pouring it actually on the floor. And then you rinse the glass in some water and swirl that around and dump that into your bucket. And then you're ready to start with another wine. And for cheeses, you have your Roquefort's and the Blues. These are always interesting to taste the difference of. And these go with the, you can do them with the great white burgundies or with the great red ones. And then there's Brie and Camembert. And these would go very nicely with your red Bordeaux's. And be sure that the Brie and the Camembert are ripe. And then some people who don't really like very strong cheese enjoy, would like the Swiss. And this is the one with the large holes, or tall holes, is Emmental. That's how you can remember it, Emmental, tall holes. And here is the other Swiss called the Fribourg, or the True Gruyere, which is much stronger and has little holes. And then you have the great American cheddar cheese from Vermont or from New York or even from Canada, which goes very well with the Beaujolais. And I think with the cheese, you should always have French bread. And you can just have great big loaves, which is rather fun, and just crack it off and open it up and put your cheese on it and eat it up. And I think if, if it's your own homemade bread, of course, it's even better than anything. This happens to be a very nice bread. It is, isn't homemade, but it's better than most. And then your little finger foods, our little tidbits, our bouchers. There's the tartlets and the little fondue, which are delicious with all of the wines. So I really think this is a great kind of a party to have and particularly having it after dinner. When we were living in Norway, we, they call them aftons, and we just love this kind of a party because it's a very you know, friendly, informal, easy way to entertain. So I'm just going to see if this wine is really any good before the party begins. So I shall say, that's all for today on The French Chef. This is Junior Child. Bon appétit. French Chef has been made possible by a grant from the Polaroid Corporation. Julia Child is co-author of Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volumes 1 and 2. <laughs>